You're listening to Packers Talk Network. Packers Talk. Do you want to experience the thrill of a Packers game at Lambeau Field? If so, be sure to get your game tickets from the longtime trusted source in Wisconsin, Ticket King. Visit their locations in Milwaukee and Green Bay. Or just go to their website, theticketking.com. Again, that's theticketking.com. Hi, this is Jerry Kramer, and you're listening to The Sweep. Looked like Aaron Rodgers pulled out a little too quick. All right, here we go, fellas. Let's have a little fun today. I feel like we can run the table. Oh, I have sizzle. What is going on, Pack Nation? Welcome back to another episode of The Sweep. I am your host, as always, Fred Thurston, and with me once again, and hopefully for the rest of the foreseeable future, after I cheated on him for two weeks, my co-host, Blaine Hornis. How's it going, my man? Going well, Freddie. Yeah, it was uh, a couple couple episode hiatus for me, but that's all right. Um, I'm back. I'm happy to be back with you, blessing the mic once again. Um, yeah, June was kind of a busy month for me. Got a lot of fish and stuff going on. My wife and I welcomed our newest addition to the family, uh, my son Blaine the Third. So that's exciting. Kind of a busy household for a couple of weeks here, so, and it feels good to be back. And what are we? 28, 29 days away from football, so it's a it's a good thing. I think based off of our episode that we have tonight with the fan questions coming in, I think we're not the only ones getting the itch to try to get back into it here. Um, not that you and I ever really take a break, but um, I think the general population is, is starting to feel the itch. Yeah, you said it. The itch is back. I feel the itch on a regular basis. I'm like a crackhead uh, throughout the entire year. Um but it is. It's fan questions part two. Uh, we did it. I did it last week with the uh, commander in chief Brian Fanfara, and it was great. And we we came out again this week, asked for some questions. You guys delivered. You guys delivered like crazy, even more than the first time. So uh, I can't thank you guys enough for doing that. You guys uh, followed us on Facebook. Tons of questions on Facebook. You guys can find us on Facebook at the sweep. Just go to that little search button up top. Click on it, type in the sweep, you will find us there. Otherwise, on Twitter, we got some questions from some good loyal fans on Twitter. You can find us there at the sweep underscore PTTF. Um, we're always on. We're always willing to banter, always willing to, to battle you guys or talk to you guys or answer questions. So don't just stop with these fan question shows. Keep them coming. Um, but I'm excited. I love, I love, I love when the fans bring the questions in. This is These are my favorite shows. Um, mostly because we don't know what's coming and everyone's got different questions and questions from left field, right field, all over the place. So I'm really excited. But before we get to that, uh, let's take a little bit of a, a moment here. And well, first of all, let, let me slow my roll here. You do deserve a full, full fledged congratulations on your son being born. I'm sorry. I didn't give you the proper due there. Uh, I know that's super exciting. I can't wait for him to get older and my son to get older and bless some type of football field together like we did at one point uh that's gonna be that's gonna be legendary i'm excited about that i appreciate it freddie thanks and uh i can't wait not that i'm trying to rush him through his childhood but i am excited for the first day he can put some cleats on and i'm sure it'll start out with flags um but damn um even (laughs) how old are we getting just to think that i know in maybe 10 short years, our kids will probably be playing ball together. Pretty crazy, ain't it? A little creepy. I can tell every day when I wake up and I have a little less hair and a little more gray that things are <laughs> happening a little too fast. So, um, But it's good. I can't wait. Um, so congratulations again. And uh, we also have congratulations at the suite because we got another sponsor. Um, a great, great friend of ours, uh, Mr. Jim Cooper. Um I mean, it's just, you know what? It's not, it's not the typical sponsor, all right? I mean, you, every, every radio show out there has their restaurant sponsor, and we got one that's the best out there. But there's, you know, the Cialis sponsor and the, the Vitamin sponsor and the Gym sponsor. No, this is a different one. This is by far the coolest one because this is 
the single greatest group on Facebook since, well, the dawn of Facebook. Um, go Pack Go, I Bleed Green and Gold. That is the that is the group. That is the number one group out there, ran by the one and only Jim Cooper, who we just mentioned. And if you are a Packers fan and you're not a fan of this group, I promise you, you're missing out. Uh, this is the place to go for all the latest, greatest info, uh, a lot of great stories, uh, fan shares, um, pictures. It's amazing. But but bottom line, it's the giveaway go to on Facebook. Jim is the most generous person in the world and his deal is to always give out to the fans, to continuously hand out to the fans and that's what he does. It's not a once a month thing, it's not a once a year thing, it's like once every week week or two. So get on there, go to Go Pack Go, I Bleed Green and Gold on Facebook, find the page, the biggest one, get involved, get on it, be active, stay loyal. And make sure you always scream Go Pack Go on it and you will get it. So thanks to to Jim and, and the whole crew at there. He runs a whole type of deal with a whole bunch of admins. It's it's a business going on there. So um, I'm excited to have him on. I'm excited to expand. I'm excited to have him come and actually have a couple guests experience or have a, a guest showing on our show. And um, we're definitely excited to have him on. So I know that Bl- I know, Blaine, you've won something. I have. It, you know what? I've been involved. Uh, you got me involved, actually, and I have I have not had the pleasure of meeting Jim face-to-face yet. Hopefully that happens. Um, probably going to be counting on you for that to happen next time he's in town. Um, but I have interacted with him and his wife via Facebook. They're very, very generous people, like you said. Um, they're very upbeat and positive, and, you know, he's, he's one of the biggest Packer fans I've ever had the privilege to cross paths with and the the Facebook page that they have, you're a hundred percent right. It's the best one out there. And the best part about it is, is they're very positive. They don't, they don't allow the negativity. If you're talking bad, if you're using profanity, if you're doing anything they don't like, they just boot you. Um, So if you're one of those people who just likes to go on Facebook and bitch and complain about everything all the time and cry when the Packers are losing and blame this person and blame that player and this coach or that coach, don't even bother. Um, It's it's a very, very positive experience. And like you said, the giveaways are phenomenal. It doesn't get any better. And it's stuff that you're not going to find all over the place. Um, Like you said, I won. I won a, a signed Forrest Gregg football that had a COA and everything with it. No questions asked and cost me a dime. All I had to do was go on and be involved. And it's it's just a great page. It's fun. And like I said, you're gonna you're gonna learn stuff, you're gonna hear stories from people. Um you, you can connect with people um for certain things, other um sign memorabilia, um meeting up for Packer parties for games and stuff like that. It's just it's great. You get involved if you're not. Yeah, it's it's the best. It's it's awesome. I'm blessed to have met him. He has been involved with with my family uh, now with the sweep. Uh, he's been involved with Pride and Glory. Uh, stay tuned for something there. We've got a great thing coming out between Pride and Glory and with Go Pack Go, so that's exciting. Um, and and uh, along with Pride and Glory being our other sponsor, we have three spo- We are up to three sponsors, man. I mean, how amazing is that? Uh, it's a good deal between, between Go Pack Go, uh, Pride and Glory, and of course our our good friends down at the ground round. I mean, that's just awesome. Um, so it's great to see that we are getting some love, and it's good to know that people are, are loving us. So um, no better way to know that people are loving us and to show our love back than a fan question show. So let's get to it. Let's get to some questions. Let's see what the fans are out there wondering about, interested about, um, and just want to know what we think about. So. Um, I'm going to start off with one, uh, and I'll let you I'll let you tackle this one first. And this is actually a good one because this is something that kind of came up this week um, when the man, you know, the gunslinger, came out on uh, I believe the the Wild and Toss show and mentioned that he would love to be a coach and potentially a coach someday with the Packers or something along those lines, sit in an office somewhere. Do you think that Favre would be a good coach or GM or 
anywhere within those realms, or is he better off, you know, living in this, riding off in the sunset, living in his in his own legacy? Oh, who asked that question? Was that Kathy Conway asked Ka- that question? Kathy Conway, my bad. Yeah, Kathy Conway, great question. Appreciate it on Facebook. Easy, easy answer from from me and in my opinion, I. <sighs> I wouldn't touch Favre with a 10-foot pole as far as a coach. Now, that's right now, in the present moment. I don't think it would work. Um, I've had conversations with many of people since this kind of came out, and uh, I don't know if Mr. Rogers is over the whole Favre thing yet. And they can say what they want and, and... and look good in the uh, in the public eye when it comes to their feud and say that everything's in the past. I just don't think that Rogers has that personality to let it go. He's never going to forget it. And um, from some of the other stories and reports that we've heard over the years from how far I've treated Rogers when he came in um, and how Rogers acted when he came in as a young kid, uh, I don't think it would work out. I just think he would feel like somebody's looking over his shoulder at all times. And uh I don't think it would I don't think that would gel very well with the team. Now as a as a, a GM I don't know if he'd make it as a GM, but maybe as a consultant and evaluating talent, um and just being around the organization, I think that's more of the role that he's gonna end up with in someday. Um, again, it's probably six, seven, eight years out, hopefully, when after Rodgers is gone, just to kind of eliminate that tension and possible friction. Uh, but as far as Favre, I love the guy. He's one of my favorite Packers ever, probably top three, for sure top three. Uh, but not yet. It's just he shouldn't probably be at Lambeau unless he's invited as a VIP guest. So even okay, so after Rogers, you say okay, but while Rogers is there, no, I, I, you know, and I don't, I'm not guaranteeing that there would be a problem, but why even take that chance and right. experiment with it? No, I agree. I totally agree with that. And you know what? I don't know. This is my thing: is that I love Rod or I love Favre. I love Rogers too. Shoot, I love them both, but I just don't know. If I totally believe in far being a coach, I mean, maybe a quarterback's coach, uh, but like a head coach, like, I just feel like that's too much. Like, that's not in his, like, DNA. That's not in his blood. Like, to have him be responsible to run a a, a team of 53 guys, like, that's not far. That's just not who I, I see him as. Now, does he have, you know, the the smarts to do it, you know, to maybe coach a certain player or a couple players. Sure. I think he, I think he definitely could, but I don't know if he could do the full head coach. I don't think people understand what goes into being a head coach of an NFL team. It's not show up on Sunday, call a couple plays and see what happens. It's a 24 seven deal. It's not? No, it, no, it, yeah, I know it's, this is shot breaking news folks, but that's not what being a head coach is. 90% of Packer fans are, would be a better head coach than Mike McCarthy, I thought. No, that's not true. 95%. I think. Oh, that was the confusion. I get that's that. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't... That's, <laughs> that's my big thing, is that I just don't see that. Now, is he, like you said, a good consultant? Potentially. But here's my thing with Favre. Is Favre was never a mechanics guy. Favre is just... Could just go out there and do it. And how can he turn around then and necessarily teach someone? Like, I don't, he never had to really learn or understand. I mean, he just did what he did and he was fantastic at it. See, Um, let me cut you off there for a second. I'm going to disagree with you there. And I'm going to kind of base it off of a comment that I saw you make on Facebook earlier this week. um, Because somebody said, well, he didn't even know what a nickel defense was. And you said, yeah, well, you didn't know how to wipe your own ass when you were a kid either, but you learned pretty quick. Now, Latter, the latter part of Favre's career, did he still take chances and do some stupid shit? Yeah, of course he did, because that's in his nature. That's what he does. But I guarantee you, the last five or six years of Favre's career, 
he knew how to read a defense. He was taking his time going up to the line of scrimmage, finding out where the safety was, finding out how many DBs were on the field and all that kind of stuff. He learned it over time. Now, right. did that did that necessarily make him a better player? Eh, one could argue probably both sides of that. But he definitely learned over the course of his career how to read a defense and what kind of plays and route combinations were going to work against certain defenses. Now, maybe that makes him more of a candidate for a quarterback's type coach anyways, like just to start with, because he knows what he started from and how to transition to a player who needed to learn. So he knows how to get that message across maybe quicker. Because I can I can just imagine Steve Mariucci and some of the other coach, Andy Reid and, and uh, John Gruden and some of the other offensive minds that had the privilege to coach Favre in the early early years of the 90s before he really understood how to read a defense and and call audibles and do all that kind of stuff, they had to be pulling their hair out. Favre would have that experience to base it off of, and a hell of a career, mind you. He's yeah. made more mistakes than any other quarterback in the history of the NFL. What I don't better, think... What better person to learn from? Yeah, I don't... No, and I don't... I don't I'm not saying he doesn't necessarily have the teachable mechanics because of the fact that he didn't know how to read defenses and he figured that out. I'm just saying in the way that he throws a football. I mean, he, it's, he, he just could do it. I mean, there wasn't really any learn curve to him. He just, now reading defenses, yes, that was something he learned and figured out. Uh, understanding plays, all that crap. But when it came to just throwing the ball... That he just threw the ball. There was no Wait, way to throw it. There was no right way, wrong way. What? How many quarterbacks come in out of college and successfully change their throwing motion and become a Hall of Fame quarterback? Zero. There's there's the point there. I mean, if you come out of college and you have to completely change your throwing motion and you're not just tweaking a thing or two here or there. I mean, my point is is you probably either have it or you don't. If you try to take a Vince Young and change his throwing motion and make him a perennial all-pro Hall of Famer winning Super Bowls, it's probably not going to happen. If you try to take a Tim Tebow who throws the ball like he's throwing a basketball, I mean, it's just not going to happen. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. It's hard to do that. Either you learn as at a young age how to throw a ball, or you learn you just throw it the way you do and you're successful at it. It's it's one or the other. I don't think it's something that you're necessarily going to be able to change someone's throwing motion. And Favre had a good one. Now, is it good to Jeff Tricky Camp standards? Probably not. But you know what? The ball came out of, at 100 miles an hour, more probably, and he was good. That's all that matters. That's uncoachable type of stuff. Now, if you want to, Aaron Rodgers, uncoachable type stuff. I mean, he he just has it. Now, has Aaron Rodgers and some of the other Hall of Fame quarterbacks in the history of the NFL made tweaks to their throwing motion and learned things that have kind of fine-tuned what they already had? Of course, that's going to happen to everybody. Even Rodgers did over the course of his career. But the complete throwing motion, I mean, you look at guys like – Who's the kid in Seattle? Why well, can't Russell Wilson? He he throws the ball goofy too, but you know what? He gets it done, and he can move, and he has other parts of his game that complement that. And I I just think that eventually someday Favre, if he decides to commit to a coaching position, I think you're a hundred percent right. It's going to start with quarterbacks, and maybe he could get to the offensive coordinator spot because it's. It's not like being a head coach. It's just the offense. The head coach has so many responsibilities. It's just too much. Um, But offensively, I think he could be an offensive-minded coach, starting with quarterbacks and possibly making it his way to offensive coordinator. Beyond that in the coaching world, I don't think Favre has a place. Um, Ultimately, I don't think he coaches at all at the NFL level. I don't think he ends up in the front office at the NFL level. I think once his daughter is done with school at Southern Miss playing volleyball, 
I think he ends up in the booth. And I think that he would make probably more money in the booth um, than he would coaching or being a GM or at a consultant or anything else for the for the Packers. And I, I don't know that he would do it with any other organization. All right. You win. You win that conversation. I mean, I'm not um, saying that he's going to, and I, I agree no, I with know. you. It's just, you're right. It's not in his original, it's not in his plan or DNA um, to be a coach. Does he have the ability to? Hell yeah, he does. Um, and you got to remember that in order for that to happen, there's going to be big changes in Green Bay. I mean, no matter what would happen, if he would be the GM or a consultant or a coach, that means that McCarthy's whole staff is probably gone. You have a new head coach, and it's probably not a good thing for Green Bay. Yeah. You know what, I'm, you know, yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, for sure, 100%, because if he's coming in, then we're probably scraping the bottom barrel. Right. Um, right. Um, next question comes in from uh, Jay Reeker, Facebook. He asks, have you ever had a pet that was named after a Packer? You want me to go after this one? Because mine's real yeah, short. No, no, I have, not. I you have not. not. I you know what? I haven't either. But you know what? I've known people who do. Um, I've known people who have named their animal Lambo. Um, my uncle Mark, uh, aka Balmer, he named his cat, I believe, uh, T Buck, after Terrell Buckley. Okay. Uh, he that because that was in his prime. Uh, my uncle's prime, I should say when they drafted Terrell Buckley, and Terrell Buckley was the sexy pick, you know, the one that we never seemed to get, and so I remember he was super excited about it, or so they say, and uh, named his cat T-Buck, and that sucked, because Buckley was terrible, and he had to have that cat for a really long time. Yep, I actually know some people that named, they got a lab the year we drafted Eddie Lacy, and they named their dog Lacey, and now he's not a Packer anymore. Dang. Bummer, right? right? I mean, yeah, see, that, that's the that's risk you take. Yeah, yeah, that's what especially, I'm saying. Especially, especially in the world of free agency now. I mean, back in the yeah. day when when you drafted a guy and they pretty much played their whole career with you, maybe a couple of years at the end with another team, it was probably okay. But now, it, that's, unless it's a quarterback who's your franchise player, uh, it's risky. Yeah. I mean, you almost have to go for the the old guys, you know, name a Lombardi or a Bart or a Nitschke right. or something, just because you and you can't, you don't have that problem. So, um, yeah, word of the wise: if you're gonna name your pet after a Packer, you better be retired. Yeah, that's it. Or uh, your friend, or your French. You could name your your dog Aaron or your cat or your yeah. gerbil or your fish, yeah. or better yet, name name your fish after the Packers because. The fish only last a couple of years anyways, aren't isn't it? Yeah, you're kind of playing the safe bet then. Yep. Um, there you go. Um, all right, next question is, this one is this one I'm excited about, and I'm going to need a little bit of help because I thought about it when I first saw it, and I haven't quite figured it all out, but I want to hit to this one. This one is from Duke Backus uh, on Twitter, and he said, what are the top three things to do at my first ever trip to Packers training camp in Lambeau Field? I thought about this one for a little bit, Duke, because I want to help you out here. Uh, Duke is an awesome, awesome fan on Twitter. He's coming up with his family, um, wife, and I believe two kids, he said. Um, so ch- keeping it somewhat PG. But I figured first Hall of Fame tour. That's yep. A no-brainer. I mean, you do that no matter what because it's just amazing. And that can, you know, you can do Hall of Fame tour slash, you know, stadium uh, tour, Lambo tour kind of thing. That can kind of all get grouped into one. Um, and then I figured if you're going to be, since you're going to be in the Green Bay area, uh, you know, get a good burger and cheese curds from, you know, Kroll's or, you know, wherever anyone might suggest but get a good hearty burger and some good greasy cheese curds not greasy because i don't like them greasy but some good cheese curds uh and a good beer and that's all i got i can't think of a third thing well i mean since he's coming up 
for training camp, I assume obvi- the obvious. Um, definitely go sit with the Railbirds and and watch an entire practice, um, and tr- try to hit because they do some in the morning and they do some kind of mid morning and then they do some later in the evening. I would try to hit one of each. Um, yeah. they're all kind of a little bit different experience. Um, and they're, they're fun. If you enjoy football, it, it's kind of, I go to at least one every year. I make a point of going to at least one every year. Um, and I, I try to not go to the same time one, two years in a row. If I only go to one, um, I try to go to the morning one and then the next year I'll go to the mid morning one. And the next year I'll go to the night one. Um, cause like I said, it, it's just, it's the same, but it's just a little bit different experience. You get a different crowd. Um, the afternoon, like evening type crowd always seems to be a little bit more amped up when something goes on. Um, cause I think everybody's awake, you know, everybody's amped up. They, they kind of plan their day around it and you know, they, they, uh, they anticipated it all day and they're looking forward to it all day long. And then they finally get there to enjoy it and they have a great time. Um, I think obviously he's probably got that on his list, but that's, that's a must. You have to go to a practice and watch the entire thing. You're going to see some guys that you're not going to see on Sundays and you're going to, you're going to see a player do something at that camp, at that practice. And you're going to remember that guy. And one of these days he's either going to end up, playing for the Packers or another NFL team. And you're going to remember that day that you saw him make that play. And you're going to say, I really liked him. I wish he was playing in green Bay. Or I remember watching him in a camp. He was really good a couple of years ago. I'm really glad he got the opportunity to finally make it on an NFL team. And, you know, on Sunday's play. Um, so that that's what I think is the most fun part about going to training camp is, yeah, it's great to see Aaron Rodgers throw from 40 yards into the net into the corner of the end zone. That's awesome. But, really watch and look at some of the younger guys and remember their names because you're going to see, there's going to be a guy this year that doesn't make the Packers squad that turns up in a couple of years to be a pretty good player. And since you're going to be coming with your children, Duke, one more thing out there, go to Bay beach, go to Bay beach amusement park in green Bay. Uh, I believe, I think it's like the oldest amusement park still standing um which is pretty insane but that's just it's just a classic little amusement park and like i said it's i think it's the oldest one so you have that nostalgia with it um but there so you have a little bit of everything you got your 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 hall of fame you got your food and you got something great for the kids um you're going to have to deal with your wife. I'm not even going to touch that because I don't want to know. I can't <laughs> yeah, handle, my own, I can't handle know, my own wife. You know, obviously, I mean, obviously their trip is kind of revolving around the Packers and the training camp and stuff, but throw in a half a day and go to, yeah, I, you're perfect. I mean, put some money in that emotional bank account with the rest of the family because you're going to be spoiled rotten <laughs> with Lambo and Ray Nishke Field and the Hall of Fame and the stadium tour and the beer and the burger and the cheese curd. You're going to have all these things that you love. Just throw a little bone to the kids and the wife and they'll be happy. Yes, sir. Always do that. Um, so there you go, Duke. Uh, there's your trip. Hope you yeah, enjoy ho- it. Ho- hopefully it's a few days because yeah. if, you're tr- if you're trying to fit everything in Green Bay and in one day, um, especially if you're involving the Packers, it's not, it's not going to happen. I I would imagine it's more than one day. I would hope so. Um, and then give me a call too when you get into town, and you can buy a shirt from Pride and Glory, and we'll come meet you and hook it up. The next question, I'm excited to hear what you got here on this one. Um, this came in from Jeffrey Malik on Facebook. He said, "Which offensive player scores the most touchdowns this season?" With obviously Aaron Rodgers being excluded. Because most Oof. likely he will take it. Yeah. Oof. That's, when I first read it, that's the first Oof. thing I did. I was like, oh, I got to think about it for a second. There's so, <laughs> so many options to pick from. Um, that's a great thing. Yeah, it is. And, you know, <laughs> this is this is a really good question. I, I should, probably should have read through these a little bit closer and thought about a couple of them before we started this. But 
Uh, just off the top of my head, I'm going to go with a newcomer, and I'm going to say that the tight end position is going to dominate this year. Um, and I'm going to go with Marty, Martellus Bennett. I think he's going to score 10-plus. Um, I know we had two wide receivers last year score, what, 15? In Adams and Rot- and uh, Jordy. Yeah. They both like 15, I think, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think Marty's going to steal a bunch of those because I don't – think our tight end was utilized as much as it probably could have been last year. And how many how many touchdowns did Rodgers have? Two, Richard? Two, two or three? three? And yeah. Cook only had like three or four, right? Yeah. Cook was only really good in the playoffs, people. I don't – everyone got a little too excited about him, I think. Well, he I, was, I did too. I did too, but – He was out for a while yeah. too. He was set out five games. That doesn't help. Um and I, I, I don't know. So that's who I'm going with. I think he's going to steal a couple from, from especially in the red zone, from Jordy and Adams. And I think he gets, I'll say, I'm going to go with 14. He's going to score 14 touchdowns this year. All right. I, shit, I ain't going to deny that. I hope so. And, and you know what? When I first read it, that was the first person I thought of as well. Um, obviously, we could easily go Jordy. We could easily go Adams um, just because – you're probably going to get 10 at least from him. Um, you, there's one guy you can't forget about. I'm not going to say his name until I hear you, who you pick. Um, so go ahead and pick I, him so I, I can. I don't think I'm going to pick who you're maybe talking about. But I, because it's a little outside, they're not really outside the box, but it's a little different. I think um, just because of his versatility, I think he could be Ty Montgomery. That's um, who I, I was going to go with. Was it? Okay, okay. good. Yes, I fucking love when I do that. Um, <laughs> I just, yeah, because I think he, you have to factor in that he's going to get moved out to the outside. He's going to be in the backfield. He's going to run it. He's going to catch a lot of screens. He's going to catch a lot of outside balls. And then it's just, he, he can, he will be all over the field. And I think, um, I think he will just cause havoc for defenses. And I think the Packers are really going to use him. And I think he's going to be a large, large focal point of this offense going into this year. Um, and and I, I, I think he would be fantastic. And so I think he will be the, the, the player with the most touchdowns. And, and I was, my head was set at 14 with him. So I'm going to go with 14 as well, but uh, just different players. He was, he was my honorable mention, buddy. So I, not gonna, you're not gonna hear any argument out of me there, um, and it kind of, you know, it kind of segues into the next question that I had on my radar. So I'll kind of read one here. It's from Blaine F. I believe on Twitter at Lego My Ego eighty um, three. His question was: Can Montgomery be the lead back, or is there another back on the roster fit to take that job and make Montgomery more of a change of pace back? Um. I think Montgomery could be anything. I think he could be a lead back. Um, I don't preferably want him to be a lead back, but I think he will be because of experience and just he'll start off the season as a lead back. Um, but I think he will be more of just that, 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 you know, um, Swiss army knife, if you will, on the offense and just, the fact that I just said, you know, he'll be in the backfield. They can stretch him outside. They can put him in the slot. I mean, how can you how can you put him in the backfield? Have a linebacker on him, and then and then motion him out. I mean, the defense is going to get just blown up on these uh, types of moves offensively. Um, but I, for me personally, I went to some camp, and and I saw um, Jamal. Williams. Uh, yeah, and I just fell in love. And I think that he he's your your lead back. He's your lead back guy. And I think he comes in um he'll start off slow, but I think he'll gain his momentum and I think he'll kind of take that role and he'll kind of allow for that offense to let Montgomery be more of a versatile guy. I think early on in the season they kind of have to put him there, Montgomery to be back there, but then everything will start to form into what we're going to be seeing for what I see as a foreseeable future, and that is Williams as our big lead back, and then Monty as kind of our scat back slash slot slash 
you know, Woodhead, Edelman type kind of guy. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, unfortunately, I I have read and heard some of the same grumblings about Williams as you. Um, you've obviously seen it in person. I, I get worried um, because one of my current rostered favorite Packers right now, I think, is going to take a little bit of a back seat um, because of this little uh, – stunt that Ted did with all these running backs. Um, I think that Aaron Rakowski is going to lose some snaps, which I, I find unfortunate because I think Rodgers trusts them, especially in pass protection. Um, if there is something that concerns me the most about having rookies come in, that's what it is, is pass protection. Um, and like you said, I don't think you can take Montgomery out. So if you have Rodgers in the shotgun or in the pistol and you have the two back set in the split, with a split backfield and you're taking Ripkowski off the field for a Jamal Williams and you have Jamal Williams and Montgomery in the backfield and you motion Montgomery out, it's obviously more often than not going to be a pass. And can Jamal Williams handle, handle the complex protections that Rogers expects his running backs to have? Um, Ripkowski has proven that he can handle it. Can a rookie, that's standing next to two-time MVP, perennial all-pro, Super Bowl champion Aaron Rodgers, handle that pressure. That's where I get nervous. Um, but to kind of get back to the question, I think Montgomery becomes your lead. He's your lead back as far as the Packers' version of a lead back. I don't know that the Packers need one. They haven't had one. Um, they didn't have one really when they won the Super Bowl. I mean – you can say Ryan Grant was if you want, or um, Brandon Jackson was if you want. But ultimately, the Packers' successes on offenses are going to come on Aaron Rodgers' shoulder or arm or whatever you want to say. Uh, but as far as another back coming in to take that job for Montgomery, I, I, I'm i not going to disagree with you because you've seen it in the flesh, and I've read some of that stuff. But I really, really hope that it doesn't come back to bite us um, in pass protection, because if it does, it won't take long for for Williams to ride the pine. I mean, yeah. it's only going to take one or two chances. If Rodgers gets hit, McCarthy and Rodgers are not going to allow him to touch the field again. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. I mean, the, is it going to hinder Rips snaps a bit? Yeah, potentially. Um, but I think that Rip has just earned the respect and the well, and right I, to be on the field. And I, I, I don't think he's going to – he's not going to be out there every single play, but he's still going to get his touches. He's still probably going to get the bulk of red zone for the at least the beginning half of the season. Um, and I, th- I still think he'll get the love just because, you know, you're not going to put – Williams back there until he gets he's got to prove himself early and quick and like you said he might only get a chance and he might get the first second he screws up you know it's it's done but from what I saw from what I saw in camp he, he's big uh, he's stout he's, he he's has that the right leverage from the way that I saw him block and move around that there's everything points to him being able to handle it whether or not he has the intelligence to understand it is going to be a totally different ball game. Yep. Yep. And I'd, hopefully it all translates, translates to Sunday. Um, Cause I mean, obviously a mini camp and, and NFL Sundays are a little bit different, but I hope okay. you're right. I hope we have all of the options. And I guess even if rips count does go down, and he kind of take goes to the back burner for a little bit. The best thing about that is, is you know he's there, and you yeah. have confidence in him if you have to go to him. Um, I just, you know how I am with with I my know. fullbacks. John Kuhn was my guy. Rip is my guy. Um, I just, I don't want to see them go to the wayside because I think it is a valuable, important part of of what Green Bay does. And <clears throat> for the fact alone that. Rodgers has the confidence in him is is very very important to the offense. 
But that, I mean, that's a great question. I think that's something that going into the season, everybody has to kind of keep an eye on uh, the Montgomery and the running back situation and what's going to happen in the backfield when with Rodgers and who's going to be back there most of the time, how often Montgomery's motioning out um, and who's going to stay in to be that pass protector. And I think you're right early on, it has to be Rip, and maybe Williams gets some opportunity throughout the season. And if he fails once or twice, he's probably not going to get another one. It'll be fun. You know what? Look at the difference from last year to this year. I mean, we've got so many options. <laughs> well, year, I, we I, I, I think, I think that was the plan. Cause I don't think McCarthy was very happy with Ted, with the situation they got in with the running back. Um, and I think we talked about it last year during, during the whole fiasco that it would never happen again. Uh, I mean, we can, I can go into, <laughs> I told you this last week, I went in and did kind of my 53 man roster and I have the Packers keeping four running backs and that doesn't include Aaron Rupkowski. So five backs. That's, I mean, on this roster, that's a lot. Yeah. But I see a lot of the, I think, um, Devontae Mays and that Aaron Jones, I think they're going to be special teamers. They're going to be yep. instrumental on special teams. They they have to be. If they keep them all, if they keep all three of those backs that they drafted, they have to be able to play special teams. Yeah. I agree. Well, they're going straight to the practice squad. Great. Yep. All right. Before we uh, hit up this next question, uh, let's take a minute and pay our debts to our our longtime sponsor, and then hear from uh, the man himself. Hey, Wisconsin sports fans. It's Ryan Bally from the Ground Round Grill and Bar here in Nina. July is one of my favorite months. Summer's in full swing, the golf course is open, and the sun is shining. We even get to see a few fireworks. But that's not where it ends. July is a big month for us here at the Ground Round. The patio is officially open, and with our large menu, new burger selections, and daily specials, we have something for everyone. Don't forget... Our outdoor patio is now dog friendly, so you don't have to leave your furry friends at home when you're heading out to grab a bite to eat. Thursdays in July are a perfect night to sit around one of four fire pit tables on the patio while enjoying live music from 6 to 9 p.m. and $1.99 margaritas. If you don't want to miss your favorite sporting event, stop by and check out our newly remodeled sports lounge that includes 21 TVs and free popcorn. If you're staying home, don't worry, we've got you covered too. Let us bring your favorite ground round items to you with delivery service offered seven days a week. Order online at groundroundnina.com or call us at 725-1010. And now, back to the guys at the sweep. All right, next question comes in from a um, good buddy, uh, Mike Schumann. And he said uh, he saw a pic of Fuzzy playing basketball once. He asked, what position did he play? and what kind of player was he? Um, a lot of people don't know this, and so I'll throw it out there. My grandpa's first love was basketball. Uh, was his love even up and through football. Uh, he grew up a basketball guy, loved the game, was a huge Wisconsin Badgers fan when he was a young kid. Um, that was his love. That's what he wanted to do more than anything in this world was, was to play basketball and be a basketball player, and he was he was actually pretty good. Um, he played for his high school in Altoona, um, and then he got a scholarship to Valparaiso to play basketball. Uh, he played basketball there for a couple years, and then um, the football coach came in because uh, after a year, my grandpa kind of got bigger, and the football coach came in and was like, hey, would you want to play football? Would you want to come check out the team, blah, blah, blah. Well, my grandpa wanted to play basketball. I wanted to continue to play basketball because, like I said, that was his thing. But, you know, he was about 6'2", 220, 230, and that's not really ideal for basketball, at least definitely not back then. Um, So he went ahead and and started playing football for Valparaiso, ended up being, you know, first team, All-American, obviously got drafted, went into the – you know, made it eventually to the Packers, and the rest is history. Um, so the interesting thing about it is that, and a lot of people don't know this, is that my grandpa, Fuzzy Thurston, never actually played an organized game of football 
until his junior year of college. And then he won six championships in the NFL. So if that's not if that's not the first <laughs> version of Tony Gonzalez, I've never heard it. Yeah, it's the craziest thing. So I mean, there it is. So at any time anyone says that a good basketball player makes a good football player, well there you go. Yeah. Um but just to, to continue real quick with Mike's question, um what position did he play? I don't know exactly. I would assume forward. Uh he wasn't he was a little too big to be a guard and not quite big enough to be a center. Um and what kind of player was he? I, I can't honestly say. Um, but from the way he played football, I would imagine he was a pretty tough dude and probably threw a little bit of elbow and got kind of rough around the rim. Um, so uh, sounds about right. It sounds about right. So you know, <laughs> it, it's cool. I actually, um, if you're listening, which you should be, you can go actually to the sweep uh, on Facebook. I will post a few pictures of him playing basketball uh, in his high school and his college days um, so you guys can get a chance to see. I'm sure that Mac or Mike, I'm sorry, I'm sure that you saw this picture. Um, could have been a picture of him playing uh, back when the Packers used to t- tour around and play against um, certain collegiate teams and high school teams or uh, for fun, kind of a, a charity type event. So um, great question. Uh, I love always talking about it because I know a lot of people had no idea uh, about his love for basketball and and the fact that he, he went to Valparaiso and never even played until his junior year. That's just to me that it is insane. You know what's funny about that, Freddie? Is you know you kind of you hear about players like that now, um, and it, it's kind of I mean it's not often it doesn't happen. It's kind of a rarity still today. But imagine how rare that must have been back then. Right to just exactly. pick up a. To pick up a game, you know, when you're a third of the way done with your life and pick it up and be what your grandpa was. I mean, yeah. he was instrumental to the success of the Green Bay Packers, the, the the most historic organization in sports. I mean, that's crazy. And to think that he didn't play any organized football until he was probably 21 years old, 20, 21 years old. And yeah he ended up being what he was to the game of football and to the Green Bay Packer organization. It's, it's a remarkable feat to, to think that that happened back then because it still doesn't happen that often now with the resources that people have to become, I mean, now if you're an athlete, you can pretty much cross over and do stuff. It wasn't that, I don't think it was that way back then. And no. the, just learning the game that late in life to become what he became is is impressive. It just kind of speaks to the, the type of player he was and the type of person that he was because he committed to it. Yeah, and, it, and it's fair to say that Ted Thompson most likely would have drafted him because you know how much Ted likes basketball a, players. A project. project. He likes yeah, a project. Yeah. He, likes the, yeah, he likes the basketball to football player, so it's uh, he would have been drafted uh, – by the Packers, so it would have all been redone. Um, but great question. Thank you for sending that in, Mike. Um, I want to hit on one uh, one other question real quick um, that a buddy sent in, Dave Bricko, um, and he, he asked, how many plays were in the playbook during the glory years? Um, this was a great question. I, I, I don't know if you had any idea on that one, Blaine. Um, the only insight I have on that one is I can just imagine it's much, much, much less than what they have now. Exactly. And I didn't know, I didn't, I had no idea. I wasn't around then. So I had to tap into my resources, uh, which were, or was, uh, my dad. Um, so I asked him and he gave me a rough estimate, um, in, in saying kind of that he believes um, there was about 60, maybe 60 plays or uh, all together in the playbook. That's probably tops, he said. Um, you know, and we, we talked about, well, that, you know, that might seem like a lot, but that's, that's nothing compared to today's playbooks. I mean, today's playbooks probably have, what, maybe 500, 600 plays. 
probably more than that. I mean, it's, not more. I mean, see, I mean, I mean, I guess that that depends on how you classify a play because you can have the same play out of five different formations. Right, and that's you, what you know I what said. I mean? that, that's what I because t- my dad said, well, there's there's probably a thousand in every playbook, and I said that's true. And the funny thing is, is there's probably only actually two hundred plays. Right. But there's there's ten variations of every single play. Right. There's different formations, lineup setups, you know, all this stuff. So different motions, um, different. Yeah, right. All. I mean, there's just a thousand. And, and the other thing is, is there's there's a lot more passing plays today than there were in the '60s. I mean, the '60s were were much more run based, and there's only so many run plays that you can really call. Um, I, I, and ex- to, kind of, to kind of piggyback off of that, I mean, you have sixty plays, rough estimate. You you probably only call about 15 to 20 of them a game based off of what what the defenses were playing at the time. I mean, I remember reading articles about the Lombardi era that there was games where they ran five five different plays the entire game. And, yeah. I mean, 70% of the plays were sweep right or sweep left. I mean, it, Why not? It, how many times have we said it, Fred, when we talk about it? The Packers ran the sweep to perfection with Jerry and your grandpa, and the other team knew it was coming, and they still couldn't stop it. Yeah. Why would you? Why would you stop running it? You didn't need more than that many plays in a game because they couldn't stop the ones you were doing. So it all worked out um, with a smaller playbook. Now that I mean, the defenses are so complex, the the offenses are so complex. Half the time, everybody can do something perfect, but if the defense plays it perfect, it doesn't matter. Agreed. 100%. Um, it is, it's just crazy to think. I mean, it's it's so so few plays compared to now. I just I can't even imagine getting a, today, a playbook for today. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, I wonder how many times in a game that they run the same play now. I mean... They have to. They have to, but... It, when you're watching a game, you don't. Nothing looks the same anymore. No, no. And that's what I think is when we talk about them having a thousand plays. It's really not a thousand plays. It's just a different look of the same play. So yeah, they're probably are running the same play ten times a game, but we just can't tell because they're run. The setup is totally different. The way they start out is totally different. The way they motion to that formation could be different, and it, everything just looks different. And it's all about confusing the defense is pretty much all it is. Yep. That's why Montgomery's going to be so good. He's going to be a versatile tool. That's for damn sure. Definitely. All right. Next question uh, comes in from James Auden. This is a legit one. Who has the better hair, Clay Matthews or David Bakhtiari? Oh, I, you know, I'm going to go with... with uh, hey, be careful. Think about it now. I'm going to think about it, and it's, it makes my decision easy because I don't think Bakhtiari has to try very hard, and I think Clay does. Ooh. So I'm going to go with Bakhtiari. I think Clay, Clay is a seasoned vet when it comes to the hair game. I think he he works on his, and I think Bakhtiari just lets it fall and hang where it goes. I could be totally off base there, but... Just based off of no, looking at it, too. Matthews is a little bit more pretty, and Bakhtiari is a little Bakhtiari's a little bit more rough around the edges. And to be a rough around the edges type of guy, his hair looks pretty damn good. I agree with you. I I think that Bakhtiari is definitely your natural beauty. Um, but it's funny that you say that because Bakhtiari's nickname is Hollywood. You know, so he's he's apparently the Hollywood. When Matthews would appear way more to be the Hollywood, um, but isn't natural Hollywood better than try hard Hollywood? I could end the show on that. <laughs> that I could that's end just... the show on that comment right there. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure and quote that and put that on Bakhtiari's Twitter before the end of the show. <laughs> Is it natural Hollywood more beautiful than what was it? Tried Hollywood. I can't remember. You're gonna to have to listen to it, buddy. Oh, I will. I will. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think yeah, I think Bakhtiari's hair is much more, much more beautiful. Um, 
All right, so let's let's finish off here with with one more question, um, and I saved this one on purpose uh, because I think that we will both have interesting uh, thoughts on this one. Um, this one comes in from from actually the guy who who won last week's question contest, uh, and that was Scott Tubbs, and he wrote, "Do you think Nick Collins' career could have paralleled Leroy Butler's had he not got injured?" I'll let you start. I, to be honest, I, I love Leroy Butler. I mean, all time top five, uh, probably one of the best safeties in our lifetime. Um, probably one of the most underrated safeties in our lifetime, which it's a complete joke that he's not in the hall of fame yet. Um, but I'm sure we could probably spend a half hour to an hour debating that. Um, that being said, I think that Nick Collins got robbed of a career. Um, it's not fair to him, his family, or any Packer fan, the Packers organization. Um, I think the fact that Nick Collins had a career-ending injury set Green Bay's defense back probably six years. I don't think – I think we're just finally now starting to recover from it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think Nick Collins would have had – he had the chance and the ability to have a better career than Butler had. Uh, no question in my mind that he was on his way to many, many all pro pro bowl seasons. Um, I think had he not gotten hurt, there's a chance that green Bay could have won one or two more super bowls. I know that one player doesn't always win you a championship, but he was, he was the leader. He was, he was the guy. He was the one that put everybody where they needed to be, and he commanded respect. Um, he also had the benefit of playing with one Charles, Wood- Charles Woodson, which I can just imagine made him ten times better, not because he played with him, but because he got to practice with him and learn from him. Um, and I, I just think, damn, I mean, Leroy Butler and Nick Collins, it, it, you can talk about them in the same breath. It, for sure, I think Nick Collins, they, they would have been, they already are comparable. And as far as a long-lasting career, I think Collins, had he had the opportunity, would have probably edged Butler out a little bit. I'd, I'm interested to hear what your take on it is. It's pretty damn similar uh, to what you were, you were saying. I actually, I, I wasn't sure where you were going to go. I wasn't sure if you were going to lean a little bit towards Leroy. Um, I think... Ninety percent of what you said there, I, I I couldn't have any argument with. I'm glad that you brought up Charles Woodson. I think that's a huge deal. Um, here's my thing: is that uh, like you, lovely Roy Butler, definitely underrated. Um, should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, I think he gets lost on a uh, on a unfortunate, really big group of great players. Um, you know, he he was great, but. I think, and, and he, I, in, I, he invented the freaking Lambo Leap. He did. He invented he Lambo. Be in the Hall of Fame for that alone. I know, I know. And you know what? I think people unfortunately characterize that more than the other thing. But um, I, I truly believe, and I, and I, when Nick Collins was playing, and, and this was the same time that Charles Woodson was on the field. C. Woods, the guy that I would name my pet after, my child after. I mean, I I would get a full-fledged back tattoo of Charles Woodson if my wife let me. That's how much I love him. Oh, but when he even when Nick Collins was on the field with Charles Woodson, I still felt that Nick Collins was the best player on the defensive field or on the field when the defense was out there. I think Nick Collins had the potential to be a, one of the all-time greatest safeties in NFL history had he not got injured. And and that is based on everything that he did. Uh, his ability, his smarts, his his, his speed, his his awareness. Um, he was on the road. He was on the track to just being hands down the best safety in the game, and would have been until he retired. Um, some quick numbers just to to kind of compare and contrast here with Cleveland Butler, though. Um, Nick Collins played 95 games, whereas Leroy had 181. So we're talking half, 
Nick Collins was half the amount. Um, Collins had 21 interceptions. Leroy Butler had 38. So Nick Collins was well past half with only half the amount of games. Uh, Forced fumbles, Nick Collins had 6. Leroy Butler had 11. So he was right there again with only half the amount of games. Uh, The only thing that Leroy Butler really had him on um, was sacks. Leroy Butler was a sack machine, and I know you remember it. He was able to come off the edge a lot, um, whereas Nick Collins did not. Uh, Leroy had 20 and a half sacks. Nick Collins had one. Um, But it was a different game, I think. I think Nick Collins was playing a different time, a different era. Um, I just, I, I firmly believe that Nick Collins would have went down as one of the greatest safeties not even in just Packer history, but in, in NFL history, had he not got injured. I was at the game in Carolina when he got hurt, and I just I, I remember saying to my buddy when we were there that this one's going to hurt us more than we have any idea. Um, and it did. I mean, you mentioned it. It took us, what, five, six, seven years to, to finally kind of get back to a decent level uh, with safety play. I mean, thank goodness for haha, but but... Um, it hurt us, and and I, shoot, you said one player doesn't win us a, a championship. He would have won us a couple more championships. We he would have been the absolute catalyst to be the guy to to make those couple changes to 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 allow the corners to to do what they needed to do and, and stop certain plays and players. And, and it would have been a, a, a we would be looking at a totally different history had Collins not got hurt. Yeah, I mean, I now that you throw those numbers out there, I mean, I'm I'm glad that I went the way I did because I thought I thought they would have been a little bit more different, I guess, to say. But it also doesn't surprise me at all because you know you you think of the I mean you think of what the six years was it six years that Collins got to play? Yeah. The last three or four, I mean, he was pretty lights out. I and mean, He probably didn't get the respect he deserved until the last year, full year that he played when he made the Pro Bowl. That was probably, I mean, he was just coming into his own at that point. I think he had room to get better than than he even showed. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, yeah, like you said, the whole, the history of Super Bowls and the Packers and as far as the safety position goes would would be all together different had had that injury not occurred. He is playing in that flag football league though, did you see that? Is he? That's good. He is. I follow him on a lot of social media and um you know he's 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 a great guy, great family. Um I got to go to his Hall of Fame induction and uh Packer Hall of Fame induction. Um you know, it's just even at even at the Packer Hall of Fame induction, there was just this sense of like, ah, oh, man, what if? Like, what if? Right. You know, I mean, watching his highlights and we're like, damn, dude, he was so we'll, fast. We'll put him in. We'll Mr. put him in, Charles, in Freddie. Mr. Mr. Charles Woodson. Makes sense. I mean, I can yeah. imagine that probably came up. Yeah. Um. He was there. Did they, talk, did, did they talk about? Did anybody say anything about how if he had hadn't gotten hurt or anything, or did they just kind of leave that alone? Um, I I believe I don't want to say they did or didn't, but I feel like at one point there was a point where it was one of those man. If you went to got hurt, you know what I mean, like. Yeah. It wasn't like a, I would have guaranteed, but it was kind of like, dang, dude, if you just went to gotten hurt, we could have had more. Like, um, and it's true. It's just so true. And I think everybody there realized it. Everybody there knew it. Um, it just, it's one of those super unfortunate situations. And, and you know, it, it probably, it, honestly, it was, the, it was the thing that probably stopped us from recreating another dynasty. I mean, we could have pulled off another two, three, you know, four Super Bowls in that time if he wouldn't have not been hurt. Um, I mean, the, that... the one the one game that pops into my head that, that would have changed a lot is the Seattle overtime loss. Oh, yeah, for sure. We would have never been there. No, we would have never been in overtime. No, 
Not even close. Um, he would have sealed the deal way earlier and, yep. and put a dagger in because that's what he did. So, um, <sighs> all right. Um, oh, now that we got all, now we got all depressed and sad. Yeah, they just totally ruined the show there. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Thanks everybody. a lot. Thanks a lot, right. Scott. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, guys, what the heck? Um. All right, Scott. Still a good question. Um, great question. I, I mean, I like that. That's a a great topic, and just to bring Butler's name up, um, at like we both had said, it, he's he's getting robbed of. I can't remember where I saw it. They put his numbers up um, next to a couple of Hall of Famers, one, a couple that have been inducted in the last like five or six yeah. years, um, and his numbers just crush them. Yep. So as far as the criteria to get in, I'm just really, really confused on, on what the voters decide on. I mean, it's like you said, maybe maybe Leroy's getting lost in the Lambo Leap talk, and maybe it's because he played with a lot of great defensive players. I mean, I think you can attribute some of his sack numbers to Reggie White. <laughs> I mean, you got Reggie White and you got Leroy Butler coming off the edge. Which one are you going to pick to block? Uh, neither. <laughs> well, you don't want to block either one, but you're going to have to at least try to get in the way of Reggie, right? I mean, because he'll kill your quarterback. He's a lot bigger, a lot stronger. Um, not that he rise a slouch or anything, but if you pick the immediate threat and Reggie's right there. So uh, I think Leroy benefited from playing with some very, very good defensive players in his era. I mean, I think a lot of people forget because of Favre that our defense in the mid-90s was – one of the best. So to have, I mean, even to think about that, you have one of the best defenses throughout the whole decade of the nineties. There's probably Reggie's probably the only one in the hall of fame on that defense. And that that's, that's doing that team a disservice in my opinion. And Leroy yeah. should be in. Yeah, I agree. I mean, for him to be a safety and a, and a captain of that team, and they did as good as they did. There's that. There's a reason for it. Right. And, and the stats don't lie. No, the stats. The stats. That's the thing that makes no sense. Because he, he. I've seen the thing you're talking about. I'm pretty sure I posted it on the sweep at one point or another. Um, he just like was, murdered. Was everybody. it Dawkins that they? Was it Dawkins, Dawkins they were comparing John to? John Lynch. Um, a couple other guys. There's one. I mean, there was a whole there's one other one. But anyways, he's he's got better statistics all around: tackles, sacks, interceptions, and compared that to the games played, it was all he beat him in all, everything. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, that's a whole other. We could probably do a whole show on that. But yeah. I just thought I'd get that in there while we were kind of on the topic. Right on. All right, so let's uh, let's pick let's pick our our, our favorite question of the night and who we. We want to get a shirt or a hat from Pride and Glory too. I kind of want to pick a repeat winner. I mean, that's that's a really good question. It's the last one we did. Um, there are there is one other one, so I'll, I'll I'll pick two, and you pick the winner out of the two. All right. How does how does that sound? That sounds good. I think uh, Scott Tubbs' question about uh, Nick Collins and Leary Butler was a, a top question for tonight. And then I think that Blaine F um, from Twitter, Lego My Ego 83 um, about Ty Montgomery and the running back situation was another great question for the night. All Who are right. you going with, buddy? Oh, man. Yeah, pretty tough. I mean, that's what happens when we, when we get, when we get the uh, fans involved. They make it hard on us. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to go tubs for two. Okay, I can't argue that, with you. That's a great question, and and I love the comparison, and I love it. It, it kind of came out of left field, um, and I I, I loved it. So tubs for two, tubs. You know, I'll get I'll get a hold of you. Uh, luckily, I haven't uh, even been able to send out your last one, so I'm gonna just do a double gift in one package. Save me some shipping. Um, but. Uh, thanks again to all the fans for sending out their questions and uh, taking the time to check us out. Continue to check us out on Facebook. Like I said it 
at the sweep, otherwise uh, at the sweep uh, underscore PTTF, or you can always find us at uh, packtothefuture.com or packerstalk.com. You can find all of our shows, articles, uh, fun stuff like that. Um, So you guys can continue to check us out, like I said, on those two sites. And uh, we're going to be back. So stay tuned. Uh, Do not go too far away because the season's getting close. And when the season gets closer, that means more of me and Blaine. And I know that makes you guys excited. So uh, stay tuned. Plenty of more shows coming. Um, Look forward to and uh, any kind of thought times Um, and different types of other fun stuff. And we'll always be doing uh, uh, fun giveaways with our sponsors. Kind of fan uh, question shows here. Um, um, even if so, we are like doing said, just, just a fan question show and we're covering and one other thing we want to touch on here is a little uh, bit more of a, stuff. a somber sure thing if, if you um, have a question for us wanna send it in give our condolences and if we don't get it on the episode we will Ted answer it Henry, uh, via uh, social Ted media his leukemia. Uh, we love hearing uh, from you guys that's what makes our show it's um, what keeps us going it's a tragic tragic thing and we enjoy it there you have it so we will we'll be back soon stay tuned for more show times but, and uh, you know, yeah. you know how it is. Always too young. Always, always you know, oh, back home. Thank you. Back, baby. Young kids. Just look inside. Speak and dance. Just look inside. Speak and dance. Just look inside. It's hard. Um, but, you know, have our condolences. Rest in peace. And uh, we'll be thinking about him, praying for his family, and and, uh, hope that they can get through this incredibly tough time.